Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi Rupert. Hello Mark. These are conversations we have where we get together and decide there and then what we might discuss that we've been thinking about or interested in very much in the hope that it sparks thoughts and even conversations um, elsewhere as well. So please listen in, but be thinking, um, turn to others, uh, pick up the threads. Um, they're open-ended, um, spontaneous, and hope that it illuminates a subject. And in fact, illumination is quite a good word because the subject which we just decided we could talk through is the subject of light. And I think this has partly come to mind because um, we're in a time still during the COVID crisis, hence talking via Zoom, um, where it, it feels like it's time to go back to basics. And light is such a basic. Um, people are talking about, is there light at the end of the tunnel? What do they mean by that? Why do we look for the sunshine? We miss it in the winter. Why is light such a widespread metaphor? So people will talk about enlightenment um, as well as seeking the light at the end of the tunnel. Or is it a metaphor? Is actually this describing something more basic about reality? And so Rupert, it was that area which I wondered whether we could sort of have a look around and see what light we can cast upon it. Um, what's, the, what's the first thought? Well, I suppose the first thought for me is that light and darkness are pol pol polar. And they're sometimes seen as you know, polar opposites in the sense of good and evil, you know, the light going to the light, not going to the darkness, etc. But in physics, um, light and darkness are clearly polar principles. I mean, the day and the night, um, one's in the shadow, the other's in the illumination. Uh, but light by its very nature is wave-like and waves go up and down. It's the nature of waves. And it's in quantum theory, in double slit experiments, not just in quantum theory, but in ordinary light too, um, if, the, if you get the, the down bits coinciding with an up bit on, uh, of another light beam, they cancel out. And so light has darkness within it. It goes up and down. And the dark bits, if they're brought into coincidence with the light bits, neutralize each other. So there's a sense in which light by its very nature has darkness within it, which is why you get those bands in double slit experiments, bands of light and darkness by shining light through two slits. Um, so I think if we look at both at the book of Genesis, the story of creation, the first act of creation of God, where he says, is the first separation act, which the book of Genesis is about, says, let there be light. And that separates light from darkness. And in Big Bang cosmology, which in so many ways tracks the book of Genesis, um, the first, one of the very first stages in the expanding, evolving universe after the beginning of the universe is what's called the decoupling of matter and radiation, where matter becomes stuff that sort of has location and, you know, things like nuclear uh, nuclei of atoms um, and those intercept they absorb light and intercept light and therefore shadows become possible which is why we have night uh, in, as the earth rotates so there's a kind of polarity running through which in poetic and in religious imagery um, is often equated with good and evil, but actually is a natural polarity. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it, it takes in my mind, as well, thinking about the science of light. Um, actually, a, a remark that um, Roger Penrose, the physicist who just recently won the Nobel Prize, um, said to me a few years ago now, but I was interviewing him about um, uh, something. And as we walked into his study, he switched on the lights. And he said, ah, oh, bathed in eternity. And I said, oh, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, I've just released um, countless photons into the room. And of course, photons travel at the speed of light, which means that they don't experience time. 
And so that is another way in which science starts to touch on spiritual themes really quite naturally. Um, I mean, another way in which that is so is when you think about the sun's light and how all life on earth depends upon the sun's light. You know, even at the bottom of the ocean, organic detritus sinking through the waves is um, fed on by the beasts at the bottom of the ocean that otherwise don't see the light. Um, and, and I think this um, isn't just that the sun light is therefore observed to be at the source, the origin of, of all life. Um, but what's even more remarkable in a way is that the sun's light um, is self-generating. You know, all the light which we um, make on earth, say by turning on lights, at some point draws on the sun's energy that has fallen upon the earth maybe through coal burning, through gas burning, through wind generation, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think this is why um, there are these natural links, actually, that um, certainly in the ancient world, um, people felt the sun must be a god, not just because life depends upon it, but because it has this quality of making its own light. And it's only gods that are self-authoring in that way, that are the creators of something out of nothing, to go back to the story um, at the beginning of Genesis. And when you feel yourself in touch with such a quality, something coming out of nothing, something self-generating, the kind of origin, the source of which light is the manifest um, experience that we have all day, every day, you feel you're in touch with the divine, something that's spiritual, something Aboriginal in that way. Um, so I reckon this must be partly why, um, you know, we love the light, we long for the light, we talk about the light at the end of the tunnel, we seek enlightenment, it's putting us in touch with this realm of reality. Yes, yeah, so I, I remember when I was living in Father Bede's ashram in South India, I was thinking about sunlight and light. And I said to Father Bede, you know, is the light of God just symbolic? Um, or is sunlight the light of God? And he said, of course, sunlight is the light of God. What else could it be? You know, um, so we, we've been brought up to believe that the whole of nature is secularized and just material particles and energetic vibrations uh, understood in terms of physical equations. And that God, if God exists, is somehow supernatural and outside the universe. But if God is light and the sun gives out light and all the stars give out light um, and there are many other sources of light, then is this separate from the divine light? And if it is the divine light, then um, it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the divine energy principle manifested in all nature not separate from nature, but actually in the sunlight. And, um, it, and actually the Gayatri mantra, which Indians chant every day, you know, it's like the Lord's Prayer of Hinduism, is an invocation to the light of the sun to illuminate our meditation. And it's called the divine splendor of the radiance of the sun. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the sun is a god, but it means it's a portal for the light of God. One could say the sun is a local way in which the light of God shines through into our solar system and shines through suns into many other solar systems too, um, at different stars. Um, but I think that the, the separation of spiritual light from uh, physical light is one of the, it's a big obstacle for us to overcome because we're such a habit as a result of a secular worldview and the scientific view of things being just physical. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and um, one of the ways where the link has been remade for me at an experiential level um, has actually been during these periods of lockdown when you know everyone says it's important to get out to have a walk and there's lots of practical reasons for that to do with health and so on um, but I also feel that part of the benefit is to get myself into natural light into the sun's light and it actually helps me and no doubt there's physiological reasons for that too but I think it it clears my mind and I think this must be linking with the sense that natural light the sun's light actually is intelligent. It carries a kind of intelligence within it, 
which again, you know, someone like Plato would say is self-evidently the case um, that, you know, it, to, to remember his metaphor of the cave, um, the idea that um, unthinkingly we are, as it were, prisoners trapped at the back of the cave, seeing shadows dancing on the wall and thinking that's life, but that part of our liberation is to seek the sunshine, to escape from the cave. And that's done through inquiry, it's done through um, desire, it's done through courage too, it takes um, all these qualities. But again, I think there's then a link back to why, say, I don't know, say why our minds can understand the world around us, obviously through science most fully, um, but it's because our inner lives share qualities with the natural world. They share these patternings, um, you know, maybe so-called laws or habits um, that we can appreciate, that our mind fits to the world around it. And I think this must be experienced in the direct effect that the sunlight has upon us. It's partly refreshing because it does refresh our minds. We, as it were, get a, a, a blast or a bath, at least, of this kind of natural intelligence that refreshes us psychologically, existentially, as well as physiologically, too. Um, so I've been holding that in mind a bit when I go for my walks during lockdown, partly just to sort of welcome it in, in that deeper sense, as well as stretching my legs and all those other good things too. Interesting, isn't it, that um, in the modern world, people often make fun of what they call sun worship, people going to beaches and lying in the sun on beaches. And this is, after all, a fairly modern phenomenon. It wasn't really till the 19th century that people started going to beaches and lying in the sun. And in most countries, certainly in hot countries, most people spend their lives trying to get out of the sun. When I lived in South India, you know, the first thing I looked for was shade. Um, but the idea of just going to a beach and lying on a beach um, is a, a kind of modern phenomenon. Um, it's, you know, something that white people in Europe started doing. And it sort of spread a bit to places like Brazil, but, um, most Indians or Africans would, wouldn't dream of going and sort of lying in the sun on a beach. Um, um, but it's often called sun worship. And um, actually, I think that there is a kind of unconscious sun worship aspect to it. Um, this drenching um, oneself in, in sunlight. And of course, now we know sunbathing isn't good for the skin and stuff, but still lots of people do it and cover themselves with sunscreen and, and creams of various kinds. Yeah, I mean, now you say that, it, it makes me wonder about what Freud might call the return of the repressed. You know, that when you cut yourself off from something, it tends to come back, but in slightly perverse forms. You know, so hence the sun, the worship of the sun, like you were suggesting in the ashram, or at least the acknowledgement of the divine sun, the, the, the sun channeling the divine. And when we get cut off from that awareness, it then pops up in strange kind of other sun worship, like lying to get blasted by dangerous rays on a beach. And, <laughs> you know, that tends to, that, that sort of thing can happen, I think. Yes. I mean, well, I think one of the other things about light that it always intrigued me is that we have light within us. I don't mean metaphorically, I mean, actually, I mean, when I dream, then my dreams are illuminated. I see things in my dreams. Um, they, there's a kind of inner light in the dreams. In psychedelic visionary experiences, where, when people have their eyes closed and see visions, then these are illuminated. So there's something about our own minds that actually has light within it, or at least is able to produce experiences of seeing things within light. Um, even if we're in complete darkness, sleeping in a completely dark room with our eyes closed, there's something at least during our dreams, a kind of light within. Yeah, um, and I think that's right. And, 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 the, and it reminds me, as you say that, about the link between light and freedom. Um, you know, why an image of someone, you know, stepping into freedom will maybe say stepping towards the light, stepping um, towards the sun and enlightenment and freedom in spiritual wisdom traditions is often associated. And I think it's because when we realize that there's this inner light that we can step into, that we can have the dreams, but then also think about the dreams 
um, we can um, seek awareness internally, as it were, cast light upon our problems um, intentionally. And that's a, a sense of freedom, which is quite different from, say, the freedom to choose, um, you know, that you can have A or B, um, as if that's a kind of freedom, which in a way it is, of course. But I think there's a, there's a deeper freedom that in a way can never be taken away from you when you um, remember that inner light allows understanding, which creates options, um, personal as, some, as well as practical, in fact. And so hence in wisdom traditions, enlightenment is often seen to be the most free state um, because intentionally you have many more room, degrees of rooms for manoeuvre um, with that kind of awareness. But then, of course, it also is part of the awareness, the freedom of the cosmos itself. Um, and its creativity, its outpouring, um, its continual spreading of life and vitality. Then there's the problem of too much light, isn't there? There's the, um, you know, the one image of the divine is as light, and the image of glory is about the divine light. In the Old Testament, there are various images of God's glory. Well, God's glory is about light, and you know, when you have in Roman Catholic churches the mass, the the, the preser in the kind of uh, what's it called, the thing with rays all around it. Yeah, a monstrance. corona, or yeah, yeah. The, 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 oh, a monstrance, a monstrance. Yeah, yeah. you have the, the piece of bread, and then you have a corona of rays all around it. That's the kind of glory, and and the halo is a kind of um, a bit like the sun round the head, giving out light. Um, so. And then there are those hymns about change from glory into glory, implying an afterlife in which one moves into brighter and brighter light. This is, of course, also in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When you die, you go into a kind of bardo realm and then you see a great light. And if you go into that light, you're liberated. But most people are frightened by it, dazzled by it, overwhelmed by it, terrified by it, and turn away from it then they get another chance, another lesser light they can go into, but they don't. And they end up having turned away from all these lights, uh, having erotic fantasies, starting becoming voyeuristic as they're out of the body, watching couples copulating, and then getting sucked into a womb and reincarnated because they've turned away from the light. Um, so a lot of the practice there is about learning to be able to go into the light uh, rather than turn away from it. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, Thomas Aquinas and others said, you know, if God is like a bright light, then the problem is that it's dazzling for us. Uh, we're completely dazzled, like you can't look into the full sun without losing your vision. Um, there's, uh, it takes practice and preparation to be able to go into the light because going to such an intense light would annihilate many of the qualities that we associate with our own identity. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And it, it reminds me of Dante, you know, who, you know, I'm working on, I think about a lot and particularly in the paradise, which is his journey into greater and greater light. And I think what happens to him there is that he as it were steps closer to the Aboriginal divine light and the intensity, the radiance, the effulgence grows. And it's, he's, on the, he's constantly on the kind of edge of what he can tolerate. And Beatrice who accompanies him um, almost titrates a little bit more light into his eyes. It's often said that when the light around him is too dazzling, he turns and looks at Beatrice and particularly at her eyes and he sees the light reflected in her, her eyes. And what, what goes on, and this is sort of becomes clearer as he ascends, um, is that he is um, in a way growing his own inner light so that it can match the outer light. And when there's enough um, resonance between the two, that's when he can tolerate the outer light. So it's, kind of, it's interesting, you mentioned there, the kind of um, the degenerate form looking at other couples coupling um, in, in that erotic sense, because in a way what he's having to do is to learn to, um, to join, to couple with the divine light um, in a sort of conjunctio sense. Um, and, and that happens because, for example, um, he, he sees his own darkness 
and um, can tolerate, can bear his own darkness. And so that doesn't hold him back anymore. Um, and then conversely, he can grow his own light. So he can sense, for example, where his virtues, um, his love, his faith, his hope, his courage, and so on, his wisdom, his intelligence, um, can actually reach out for the, the wisdom, the love, the intelligence that's in the divine light. And when those two things can touch, then his own wisdom and love and intelligence can grow into that, you know, maybe like a plant reaching for the sunshine. Um, and so this sense of moving towards the dazzling divine light is, is a kind of inner quest that he has to be helped towards, um, but then his own light can reach for the divine light. And so he can be full more and more of the divine light. And he says when he gets to the sphere of Saturn, which is where he meets the contemplatives on earth and the contemplatives he is told there um, are the individuals who even in their earthly life could tolerate the, the, the beam of pure divine light coming into them. And it could find a, a womb, a nesting place, a, a sort of container um, within the light of the contemplative person who had done this work on themselves to foster their own inner light so that it could meet the divine light. Um, it, it's, it's, it's rather a brilliant description of things, which I'd never fully appreciated actually till I read Dante in the Divine Comedy. But and maybe that does make some sense there with what, what you're saying in other traditions too. Sounds like it, sounds very similar. Um, and of course the, 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 the sun uh, is not only a source of light, but also a source of heat. And that's why going into this intense light, which is associated with heat, you know, the, the, you measure the heat of something by the, the um, wavelength of the light, you know, something that's red hot is not as hot as something that's white hot. You know, when you buy electric light bulbs now, it has that sort of 3000K or 5000K uh, to give you this sort of sense of whether it's warm light, reddish or brighter. Anyway, it's, so light is linked to heat, and certainly in the case of the sun, and indeed in light bulbs and things, um, and fires. Um, and if you do go into the heat, the surface of the sun's 5,000 degrees centigrade, um, um, this would imply some kind of dissolution of our normal being. Um, and, you know, I, I, it, this is difficult for people who want to have individual life after death go on for you know some I'm personally I don't want to go on being Rupert for eternity um I'd be quite happy to go through a transitional period and then move into light in a sense of a more dissolving into the light um kind of metaphor but uh, it does seem to be implicit because you can't be in 5,000 degrees centigrade or higher temperatures and uh, still retain normal organization of bodies. Yeah, well, there's actually, there's a parallel discussion to that perhaps in the Divine Comedy as well in the Paradise where Dante asks the saints um, that he meets in heaven. And by saints, he just means those who can tolerate the divine light because actually it turns out all sorts of people are there who you wouldn't normally consider to be saints in fact. But anyway, he asks them about their eyes and says, how come your eyes are able to tolerate this divine light? Because on earth, you couldn't even look at the sun, let alone look at, at God straight on, straight on, because, I mean, it's not being dissolved in 5,000 degrees of heat, but because nonetheless that focused heat would, would burn the back of the retina. And, and what they, the souls tell him is that um, there is a transformation um, and they, they understand it um, as how our material bodies um, are kind of, only partially actualized parts of ourselves, that um, the matter is kind of spirit potential. And that part of the transformation that goes on is that as matter becomes more and more actualized, as um, it becomes more and more and, and fuller of the life of which it's capable, so at the same time, it becomes capable of the divine life. And that's why their spiritual bodies in heaven um, are um, so much more, in fact, than just their earthly bodies and their, uh, their earthly personalities. They're, they, they, it's, a, it's a massive sort of sense of expansion, if you like. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to understand, although an analogy which I've drawn on is, um, if you think of something like oil paint, say, um, in its tubes, 
And what the artist does is sort of squirt that matter out onto the palette, as it were. It's, it's now potential paint um, that could become the picture. And it's by the light of the artist's imagination that the oil paint becomes, say, the sun, the moon, the landscape, the water, whatever um, the painter is painting. Um, and the oil paint becomes so much more than it was when it was just in the tube um, by the light of the artist's imagination. And so mm. I, I wonder whether, you know, I agree with you. I don't particularly want to be just Mark with my troubles here on Earth the rest of eternity um, and hope that there's some kind of fuller realisation that we get intimations of perhaps on Earth. But there is about the expansion um, of ourselves to be able to participate more and more in, in the divine life. Well, curiously enough, talking of expansion, um, Roger Penrose, who you mentioned earlier, in his theory about um, cosmology, his latest theory about cosmology is that the entire universe goes on expanding faster and faster until all the matter evaporates into light. And the universe sort of ends when everything is dissolved into light. Um, it's the opposite of the uh, contracting universe cosmology, which was fashionable till about the year 2000. People thought that because of all this dark matter and mass in the universe, the expansion of the universe would slow down, then it would stop expanding and begin to contract and contract faster and faster till it all imploded into a terminal black hole. So that vision, everything ended in darkness and Penrose's vision, everything ends in light. Well, fortunately, we're poised somewhere between the two at the moment. Um, uh, but it's interesting that his cosmological vision is of the entire universe being dissolved into light, which then, he says, gives rise to a new universe um, it, by a kind of mathematical sleight of hand. He suddenly says, well, if it's all light and it was, has no dimensions, then you might as well sort of contract it by sort of thousands of orders of magnitude until it just becomes a big bang and starts another universe. That's, I think, slightly fanciful, but it's interesting that his cosmology is the entire cosmos transformed into light. Yeah, well, um, I, I actually, I mean, since he won the prize, I've been, um, you know, kind of rereading some of his, his work and he, he does the very highbrow work, of course, um, better than the vast majority of physicists. Um, but nonetheless, he's, he's good at explaining things. And the, the way that I've read, he explains that transition from this massively expanded cosmos where all is light to the beginning of something new is that when everything all becomes light, not only does time disappear because light exists in eternity and timelessness, but also space disappears because time, for the same reasons of traveling at the speed of light, light doesn't know dimensions either. And so you suddenly, you, you move towards a cosmos where there's no space, no time. And that is, as it were, the Aboriginal seedbed, the source, the origin for a new cosmos um, uh, out of nothing, um, literally, um, you know, describing out of a zone, a reality in which there's no space, no time, out of eternity. Um, so it's extraordinary the, the way that this maps onto um, the, the, the idea of God being the source of, of creation. Um, you know, described, as you say, in these kind of rigorous mathematical ways, um, but imaginatively hugely suggestive. Um, I mean, just a final thought, perhaps, from me, because um, another thing that's so evident in Roger Penrose, which I think is a really useful guide here, is that um, he is a physicist who's very clear that beauty is a guide to what's true. And of course, beauty, in a way, triangulates light and truth. Um, you know, something which looks beautiful, which is enlightening. Um, these things kind of go together. And um, Plato would have understood that as um, beauty is the experience of our minds connecting with something in reality around us. You know, when we follow an argument, um, it feels beautiful. When we see a picture, um, it feels beautiful because our inner life connects with the outer life of the world around us. And, and that experience is the experience of beauty. Um, but you know, just in terms of taking steps towards the light, it's kind of following the line of beauty is often the way of doing it. Does this feel a beautiful move for me to make? Does this feel a beautiful argument for me to follow? Um, and, you know, this is an indicator, I think, of moving towards the light, 
moving towards the divine um, because our minds are connecting with what's true and that feels beautiful to us in all the ways that we can experience beauty. Gosh, a rich theme, Mark. I think we we'll have to leave beauty for another day. But um, I, th I think that was, I think time's up, but I think that was very interesting. And thank you for bringing up this subject. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I, I appreciate um, the thoughts and, and hope that it is, it brings some light to people, um, whether they're literally in dark times, if it's still the winter or dark times for other reasons as well. Um, light is always good news. So thanks very much. Thank you.